Hello everyone, I would like to welcome all of you to yet another webinar by India Behavior Economics Network. Our theme for today is higher education in BE and we have put together a panel of diverse speakers to guide you through the process of applying for a master's in behavior economics in multiple countries including US, UK, India, Scotland and Paris. So we look forward to this uh, webinar and hearing from our speakers, and we really hope that you get to take something back with you at the end of the webinar. So our moderator for today is Rama Gokhale. A little introduction about her. Rama is an MSc Agri Business Economics graduate from the Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics. She started off her career in marketing and growth strategy firms, which led to her interest in consumer choice and decision making. She also completed a 12-week behavioral economics program called the BIC program, which is led by Alumes from Harvard and Columbia. And she will be your moderator for today. So over to you, Rama. Speaker of today is going to be Sriram Sridharan. From, uh, he's from the US. So basically, he graduated uh, as a master's in behavioral and decision sciences. Uh, the program is from University of Pennsylvania. He's also country, uh, completed his undergraduate studies there. He currently lives in New York, but he grew up in Saudi Arabia and India, which itself is very interesting, I think, until he moved to the US for college. He's now a senior associate at Ideas 42, a research and design nonprofit. They use behavioral insights to create social impact. And he currently works on issues like economic justice, primarily within the child welfare system in the United States. He's also worked on issues in global health, such as malaria, case management in Nigeria, and open defecation in India. Uh, so over to you, Sriram. Uh, I hope we have a really great session ahead. Hey, yeah, thanks very much. I'm super excited to be here. It's a pleasure uh, to meet all of you. I'm always, always excited to connect with fellow behavioral science enthusiasts. And um, yeah, I'm, uh, enough enough that I'm smiling at 8 a.m., which if, if you ask my partner, you'd, you'd know is a, is a rare sight. Um, all right, so let me share my screen if... Um, I, great. Um, is that, are all of you able to see the shared screen? So I, I, I threw together a few points uh, just to chat through today. And... Um, Let's see, yeah, so in, in the full group, I believe I have about um, five to seven minutes. So I'm, I'm gonna try and just cover a couple of slides of content pertaining primarily to uh, the behavioral science program that I uh, did at the University of Pennsylvania. And in the breakouts, we can cover a whole range of other topics, including you know navigating employment and what student life is like at Penn, um, working at Ideas 42. And you know anything else that you'd like to talk about? Really, I'm I'm happy to. Um, I've, I've this is a uh, suggested assortment of topics if you'd like to uh, pick from uh, that are close to my close to my heart and mind at this moment. All right. Uh, so let's jump straight in. Um, so, Master of Behavioral and Decision Sciences program at Penn is a one-year degree that. I started doing right after my undergrad. Um, so just quick background on how and why I got there is uh, a big part of my undergraduate education, I focused in the behavioral sciences. So there's this wonderfully inter interdisciplinary major called uh, philosophy, politics, and economics that I spent four years studying in which a big component was focusing on choice and behavior. So I did a bunch of coursework in behavioral economics, social psychology, social norms, specifically in that area with um, Christina Bicchieri, who is a bit of a sort of founding figure in that space. And that sort of really drove my interest to, uh, you know, jump into the deep end, so to speak, in, in the behavioral sciences. Right out of undergrad, I had, a, had the opportunity to do some research assistantship with her in uh, a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation pro, uh, grant uh, studying open defecation in India, which super happy to talk about um, in our breakout. And I, it was sort of a neat segue from my undergraduate studies really. I'd already done a bunch of coursework um, and gotten some research experience. So it, it, it was a natural choice for me to go into that program. So what was the coursework like? Um, I'd say I focused primarily on these three buckets. Um, so the first one is sort of core behavioral science training, including electives. 
I've thrown in a couple of examples of that here. So one is an advanced applied behavioral economics class, um, which covers sort of the gamut of uh, sort of foundational theory in behavioral economics, as well as delves into different uh, specific areas, uh, sort of sub areas that have developed, you know, far from the days when uh, prospect theory sort of created the core of it. And uh, as a taster for what the uh, sort of applied nature of it looks like, it culminated with this, you know, uh, absurd and wonderful project of from design to analysis, conducting an entire randomized control trial on campus, um, which is sort of is a, is, a, is a beast of an undertaking to uh, go on when you're also in a few other courses and you know, doing whatnot. Another class as an example within the core behavioral science training was um, this great behavioral science applications and public policy class, which you know I can only describe as uh, this this listicle in class form, where you know every every lecture you go to is this a uh, uh, great exploration of uh, behavioral science applications in a particular focus area or uh, you know uh, sub area of of public policy. So in one class you're looking at behavioral science applications and say like, you know, tax collection and enforcement and you show up the next lecture and you're looking at applications in uh, energy conservation. So really covers the uh, entire span of things. It's a, it's, it's a great class. Um, and then the second bucket was in methodological training. So, um, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, this in the, in the next and last slide for the full group presentation. Um, it, I, I took sort of a good hard look at what's core skill sets I'm missing for, for me to actually, you know, sustainably apply behavioral science in different uh, areas, especially in public interest, which is where I was headed. And uh, a lot of sort of quantitative training was missing from my uh, plate at that point. So I focused a bunch of effort on quantitative modeling, which focuses on uh, things like network analysis uh, that helps you, you know, understand and use different statistical and quantitative models to actually uh, look at the spread of behavior. Um, and of course, uh, sort of core statistical reasoning for behavioral science where I learned R from scratch. Um, it, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun, I'll, I'll say that much, um, to, to do that during the academic year. And finally, um, I picked a sort of clear concentration area, which was in public health policy and delivery. Uh, so, you know, half of my coursework was with masters of public health students, basically, um, so and I was, I was using my entire time in this one year program to see how I can strengthen my understanding of applying behavioral science, specifically in the health space. So some of my coursework there included, you know, looking at health policy fundamentals in the US context, looking at uh, global health delivery and programming, and also this great class called implementation science and health which explores this sort of relatively nascent topic on how to increase the uptake of evidence-based practices in clinical and non-clinical health settings. Um, so yeah, let, let me just cover these uh, quick four points on my two cents on what making the best of the program entailed and then would love to hand off to other speakers today and uh, hear from all of them. Um, so first of all, it's a professional degree. Uh, and you know it's 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 best used to explore a particular intersection, coming in knowing what you want to do, rather than sort of using it as an exploratory program. You really don't have time for that to begin with, um, and it, it it allows you to leverage particular, say, university infrastructure and resources within the institution to the best ends. If you really come in understanding, okay, you know, I want to explore, say health and behavioral science or you know, some other specific area. Um, and doing so with some sort of backed up job market research was certainly helpful. So, you know, mapping out what opportunities are out there, what opportunities you may be able to pitch um, and taking a good hard look at sort of what skills you really need to build to find yourself marketable at the back end. Um, and while doing this, like I mentioned, uh, leveraging university infrastructure through coursework was, was a key pillar of making the best use of the program, I would say. You know, the University of Pennsylvania is, is a multi-billion dollar institution, and what comes with that is these you know, weird and wonderful niches 
um, that have entire centers dedicated to them. So one, one example is the Center for Health Incentives and Behavioral Economics. Uh, so it's an entire sort of uh, funded center that exists to look at that intersection, which is precisely where I found myself most interested in. And, you know, I created sort of relationships through that center, um, took coursework with people who work in that center and found myself with opportunities in uh, National Institute of Mental Health grantees working on using behavioral economics in the mental health space, you know, which creates you know, good segues for you, both in terms of, you know, um, applying behavioral science within the scope of the program itself, but also being able to demonstrate what you can do for an employer later on saying, hey, you know, here's some sort of substance, substantive research opportunity or project work that shows my ability to actually deliver insights and results, um, rather than sort of telling them what coursework you took, which really doesn't convey to them what you need. And finally, you know, uh, looking to, uh, excited to dive in more into any of these topics, but if, if, if I were to leave you with one piece of advice is, uh, you know, I know it can be scary, but, you know, make a commitment to sort of cold email people and build relationships. And that's really, you know, uh, key to uh, finding yourself in a good spot in making the best of any program, really. Uh, you know, it's, it's scary, you know, but it's just as intimidating for me as anybody else. Um, but, you know, I made a commitment to talk to at least sort of one professor or person who's taken any given class before actually diving in similarly about jobs. Um, yeah, and I cannot recommend more highly sort of taking that proactive approach, even in a well-established setup uh, to build relationships over time. I know that was a lot to cover and you'll, you'll all be bombarded with even more information over the next 30 minutes. So let me stop there and hand over. Um, but looking forward very much to meeting uh, at least a subset of you in the breakouts. Thanks. Well, that was amazing. Um, I think we all learned a lot, definitely. Um, and yeah, we look forward to speaking with you, Sridham, in the breakout rooms. Um, our next speaker is Amir Dandekar. Uh, he's uh, basically, a, he has a master's degree in behavioral science for management from the University of Stirling in Scotland. He's currently a student of behavioral science and economics at Pantheon Sorbonne and Paris Idikart University. Uh, he has a passion for behavioral insights, research, HR training, and development. Um, I'll hand it over to you, Amir, uh, to explain what all you've done. So, ah, okay. There we go. So, first off, good morning, everyone. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm so sorry, my time zones are off. Uh, my name is Amir Dandekar and I'm currently a student of economics and psychology in Paris. Uh, like Sri Ram, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover just two points out of my uh, huge bundle of notes here today and the rest I can cover in breakout rooms. So it's a good thing you had Sri Ram first because he was the more of the professional bit. I'm more of the researcher bit so I'll be talking about uh, I'll be talking about behavioral science and behavioral economics as a research field. And for me, that started with uh, getting into the behavioral economics course at Stalin. It was, uh, it was a course oriented towards people who wanted to pursue a behavioral science degree in research. And as far as the coursework was concerned, uh, like Shriram's program, it was divided into bundles. Uh, we had the two main bundles were, one of that was core behavioral economics. However, it, uh, it focused a lot on rationality, decision-making and probabilities. And the psychology uh, or the behavioral science part came in at the application stage. So they started us off with a lot of core, essentially core economics. Uh, and then they saw, and then they leaned us into behavioral decision making. So that was a little interesting because because the last time I'd done economics before that stage was high school. So this is one. So this is one thing you should be aware of that if you sign up for a behavioral economics course, there are some courses which will tackle behavioral sciences and behavioral economics from the psychologies from the psychology side and from the psychology perspective, but some courses will do it from the economic side. And for that, you need to know your economics well. 
and so therefore i would recommend that if you uh, if you join one of these like Sri Ram, come in knowing what you want to do because that will help you choose the right program for example so someone who's interested in health psychology uh, my program would not be suited for him because mine is probability and decision making and game theory a lot of it so that that is one that was one key component and the second component of course being a research degree was a master's thesis which included a whole gamut of things in uh, starting from r which i also learned from scratch and i can confirm to sri ram's testimony it's incredibly fun to do so that's all i'll say about that and uh, regarding the other research part it uh, we had definitely had a choice on what we wanted to do a thesis in however uh, at least in our course it was mandatory that you have to do uh, which meant that i i had to do a randomized control trial at some point however one good thing about uh, programs like mine, or at least the one I was in, and also the one that Shiran talked about in the US, is not only do you get to build networks, but sometimes you get to capitalize on those networks to actually do your master's thesis, and that can be very helpful. So, for example, in my course, I got an op I got the opportunity to work as a research consultant for an organization called Keep Scotland Beautiful, which essentially wanted a policy evaluation and an assessment of all the interventions they had under the policy with respect to with respect to their initiatives in transport so they were trying to so they had interventions going across all across scotland focusing on uh, public focusing on getting people to sign up for more sustainable transport methods such as giving up a car for use for a bus and they wanted an assessment of the way that they've been doing things and for and i happened to get in touch with one of the coordinators of that uh, of that organization in one of the research seminars on campus and that's where it kind of took off so building networks is key in this field i would say because it gives you opportunities that you may not have even you you may not know that uh, that they even exist which is which is very very useful and of course the of course being a government organization it was funded and i therefore i could carry out uh, a policy evaluation across scotland and this is where i would focus on two two types of essentially two fields that you can go into uh, if you do uh, if you end up going into behavioral economics one is of course the professional field where you're actually the guy who's looking at issues designing interventions doing randomized control trials and the other part of it is policy evaluation right there are a lot of lot of organizations and companies who will want to know essentially what the policies that they have how effective are they being and if they're not being effective what exactly can i do about it so policy evaluation is a very uh, is it's a very resourceful field i would say and it's also something that you can look at if you're going into behavioral economics uh, if alongside of course uh, being a professional who actually designs interventions uh, the good thing about uh, doing it in the uk was this organization called the behavioral insights team it's a behavioral insights team it's registered as a, a social organization they work out of the cabinet office in london they are very much a part of the british government and their job is to inform british public policy through behavioral insights so so working with them is it's a huge uh, it's a huge pleasure because you get access to essentially working on a macroeconomic scale and organizations like these the other one that i am hoping to get involved with now is jpal which is run through from mit by abhijit banerjee and Esther Duflo. Uh, if you don't remember them they are the 2019 nobel laureates in economics but uh, their niche is essentially uh, poverty alleviation 
and therefore as a as a behavioral sciences professional uh, i have the opportunity to use to leverage my skills in order to design better policies on poverty alleviation because i understand the because i understand behavior under uncertainty so if no matter what behavioral economics program you join probability uncertainty and decision making are going to be your best friends and your worst enemies so my two key sense would uh, would be very similar but with a slight twist uh, one good one advice i would give is if you're joining a behavioral economics course brush up on your economics because you will absolutely need it no matter what you do even if you go into health even if you go into a poverty even if you go into policy evaluation you will need economics to effectively apply psychology because at the end of the day you're applying behavioral insights to what is essentially a, a policy initiative which comes from economics so brush up on your economics and second uh, the second thing i would like to point out is when you enter a program make sure you are clear on at least what area of work you want to go to if you want to go into research you have to find a program that's oriented towards research and if you want to become a professional and if you want to work in the industry you have to find a program uh, like sri rams which is geared towards the professional side um so make sure you know at least whether you want to be in research or whether you want to be in professions because into a professional job because the the training that will be given in the program will be tailored slightly differently right and yes i think uh, of course it's a huge field and like sri ram i'll be covering most of it in the breakout rooms uh, if you want to i i'll also be able to advise on uh, scholarships i'll also be able to advise on france so you'll be getting a new you'll be getting to experience behavioral science in france as well which is slightly different but uh, yes uh, i think i'll hand it over to the next speaker and i will see you guys in the breakout rooms Oh, I think uh, people are going to be flooding you guys with a lot of questions. I myself have so many, you know. Uh, but okay, let's move on to our third speaker, uh, Apurva Mathur. Uh, Apurva basically holds a master's degree in behavioral and data science with a distinction from the University of Warwick. Her time at LSE Summer School introduced her to the world of behavioral economics, and that eventually inspired her to pursue her master's. Apurva currently works as a behavioral designer at Kauri Consulting. Her work involves using behavioral science principles to design intuitive as well as elegant customer and employee experiences. Uh, Apurva, over to you. Thanks so much, Rama. And first of all, a very big thank you to Ivan for organizing this session. This is um, this is such a nice initiative, and I wish we had more of the sessions when I was trying to navigate my journey. um of course when my post grad studies so thank you so much uh, everyone at iben and i'm i'm really excited that i'm going after amaya because i can just piggy back on a little bit of what you said amaya about knowing exactly what you're looking to do after your post grad is really important whether you want to get into research or whether you want to um work in the industry uh that is super important and i hope that you know that is one thing that you can take away from this entire session so like rama mentioned i um pursued behavioral and data science at borick and this was a really interesting course when i did it in 2019 i think it was just 2 years old and the course is a brain child of professor thomas hill and what he says was that there is almost a gap uh, a missed opportunity to train behavioral scientists into data science techniques as well you know so that they are um, able to think slightly bigger they're able to analyze um, big data they're able to use the latest techniques in machine learning uh, in data analytics to you know just uh, understand human behavior uh, a lot more and so that's why he kind of came up with this program where you are um and the program is interdisciplinary it's offered by the department of psychology together with the department of computer science at warwick so essentially you do about 10 11 modules you have five uh, core modules and the rest you get to choose so they are your elective and they are like 
a mix in that you can, you know, you do five modules from the psychology department, so they are related to behavioral science, and then you do five modules. Uh, it's Warwick, yes. Uh, the W is silent, if that's what you're asking. Sorry, Gauri. Um, and sorry, what was I saying? So yeah, and the other five modules are data science either you're learning a little bit about machine learning techniques visualization natural language processing so five modules you get to choose um, that are um, from the computer science department and honestly like i had no background in engineering i had never done coding before but i after my undergrad i wanted to definitely work in a professional setting so i was working towards making myself more employable. So I was upskilling myself in coding because I was aware that, you know, data science, the skills are so um, much in demand. Then I was, you know, just teaching myself R and Python on my own. So I was already kind of going towards that um, stream, uh, even without like any kind of professional formalized training. And after around my third year, I was so confused uh, um, doing my undergrad, you know, economics. I wasn't 100% convinced that I want to continue doing economics uh, or what I wanted to do. But um, in my second year of uni, I had this amazing opportunity to go to LSE for um, a short summer uh, course, you know, at the summer school. And that's where I just on a way, you know, it was also around the time that Richard Taylor had won his Nobel in uh, behavioral economics. And was, it just felt right. And I've always been interested. I've always, you know, been interested in psychology. So I was like, okay, I'm, and LSE had just that year introduced an intro to behavioral economics course in their summer school. So I was like, yeah, I'm just going to pick this course and um, I'm just, I'll just see what happens. And it was the best two weeks. Uh, I loved going to class every single day. I was so uh, just, you know, mesmerized by the, just what I was reading, what I was learning. I was engrossed in it. And it, I just really enjoyed it so much that, I thought that was probably my calling. And then I found this course at Warwick, which just felt right. You know, I was teaching myself data science uh, and here was an opportunity to combine these two things that I was, that I always felt were disparate, but they were not, you know, there was an intersection that I could explore at this course. And the course at Warwick is very, uh, is, you know, like Amaya was talking about, this course is oriented towards making you employable. These, this course, um, you know, gives you skills that people in the industry are kind of looking for. So it, it really does prepare you to work, uh, you know, at the end of it. Um, that's not to say that you can't go and pursue research. Um, most, so like I said, this is a relatively newer course. So we had, I think, only about 15 people in my year, but it is steadily growing. So that number keeps on increasing increasing year on year, but it is still a relatively smaller course. Uh, at Warwick, they also have a sister course, which is called Behavioral and Economic Sciences, which is almost like a sister course, but that's offered with Department of Psychology and Depart Department of Economics. And I'm just letting you know that in, in case you don't want to pursue this data science uh, combination, there's also another combination that has been, um, that started in 2014, so it's a bit more established and that had definitely a bigger cohort it's a lot well uh, you know better known as well so that had um, a bigger class size um, and they they did not have the data science module attached to, to them but again you have that little bit of a choice there as well if you want to study at Warwick uh, with that I also want to say that one of the biggest advantages of studying at Warwick was this behavioral science careers fair that they host um, at around December time. So you've been, you join in September and around December you get to um, attend this behavioral science fair where they call on all the companies, all the industry leaders who do behavioral science. You know, this is your opportunity to meet everyone that can potentially offer you a job at the end of your course. And I, I loved that because that was the time where I get to, in just one room, I can meet everyone. Um, so like I'm, had this in 2020 around that time we still did not have the graduate visa for the uk so it was still a lot harder the opportunities were i would say limited because a lot of them were not ready to sponsor international students but i i'm guessing that has changed now so you're definitely going to have a lot more opportunities open to you which is great but that the the you know event i think is really really strong and that is offered to um 
University of Warwick, LSC, and UCL students uh, who are doing behavioral science, you know, are all invited to that fair. So that was great because a lot of, you know, for other established industries um, like consulting, law, engineering, you all the big universities keep doing careers fair, you know, anyway. But this is just an event dedicated to behavioral science companies that you can meet, you can network with them. And that was just the best experience because that's also where I met my current company where I work at. So um, I can't recommend that enough. And obviously, if you can network and you can start creating that relationship, even before you get to, um, even before you start with your course, nothing like it, I would can't recommend that enough. Unfortunately, like I didn't, I feel like one of my learnings is that I did not start soon enough. You can network and you can, you know, create, start creating those relationships even before you go and, you know, um, start your course. That's, that's the best. Uh, and yeah, I think I'm going to keep it pretty high level. You know, I uh, if I can just take a couple of minutes to talk about Kauri, um, that's it. But if you have any more specific directed questions, please find me in the breakout room. I'm happy to, you know, answer those questions. And uh, so basically Kauri, where I work um, now is a behavioral science consultancy. So essentially what we do is apply behavioral insights in the private sector. Uh, it is great because you get to work with some of the biggest names um, and biggest brands, and you're trying to improve their customer experience, their employee experience using behavioral science insights. So it's slightly different. And I feel like my course at Warwick really, you know, prepared me, like gave me a very overall uh, just set me up for success at my current job, which I think, um, you know, is worth mentioning. Uh, but what I do here, I am a designer. That now, Design skills are something that will not, that are, I don't think, covered in um, a lot of behavioral science masters. But essentially what I do at my work is to use um, our understanding of how the human brain processes um, information. So that could be visual information, auditory information, and to just use that knowledge to design experiences that are more motivating um, for the customers or the employees. So there's um, a lot of like UX journeys, it's a lot of comms design, a lot of physical space design. So that's the kind of um, projects that I work on. And um, again, the, the design bit is something that is self-taught. So I did not learn it in a course, but it's something that you can easily train yourself in. And that, that, so that has been my journey towards my current role as well. Um, I'm not going to take any more of your time. Once again, thank you so much for having me. And if you have any questions, once again, just find me in the breakout room. I'd be more than happy to answer them. Thank you so much. Thanks, Apurva. I think uh, something that all of us maybe can relate to in the behavioral sciences is this feeling of, you know, things just clicking one day, you know, you see that intersection between psychology yeah. and economics and you go, oh, oh, wow, this is something that exists. So I really um, totally, you know, agree with that. Um, and I think a lot of other people also would uh, definitely, you know, recognize that experience for sure. So uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, our fourth speaker is Khyati Dharmashi. Uh, she is also uh, from the uh, UK. Khyati uh, is basically a research consultant at Sattva Media and Consulting. And she brings over six years of experience and understanding of the Indian development sector. At Sattva, she's undertaken various qualitative and quantitative studies in various sectors, ranging from human trafficking, migrant housing, responsible technology, talent management, informing strategies and interventions on various philanthropic uh, clients, as well as multilateral organizations. Prior to Sattva, she also worked with Boonj, which is a leading nonprofit organization working in the rural development and disaster management space. Um, she's also been a Gandhi Fellow. She holds a Master's in Psychology of Economic Life from the London School of Economics and Paul Science. Um, Kathy, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Raman. Thank you again, I think. Uh, thank you for organizing this. I really relate to Apoorvan. I wish uh, this was something I could have attended uh, before getting into the course that I got into. It would, be, uh, it would have been amazing. And just like you mentioned, uh, Finding a course that really connects psychology to economics was my aha moment as well. So um, I think I, I had studied psychology in my bachelor's and uh, then I did Gandhi Fellowship and I worked uh, in the development sector for around four, 4.5 years. And I really, like livelihood was an area that I wanted to really break down and understand how people understand money. How How is it that we are, we as humans are behaving with money. 
and i think that was my intention when i chose the course uh, that i chosen like i think uh, i mean i then i I'm, i'm sorry if i'm uh, mispronouncing your name but uh, may i mentioned uh, about really knowing what course you're getting into so my course was really very heavy on psychology uh so psychology of economic life really looks at more from social psychology and economic uh, psychology tries to introduce you to different kinds of economic thinkers um uh, and understanding of what economic behavior really means uh so that i i'm also going to be really keep it very high level and get into a lot more depth uh, in the breakout room uh but the course one at one part looked at understanding economic behavior and at the second uh, part really tried to understand how can we really shape economic behavior in a way uh in order to make our uh, communities societies organizations and businesses more sustainable and really that's where it really deep deep dives and looks a lot into designing for uh change or beha- using behavioral sciences for uh, societal change or changes in business models of the sorts uh, so i think that's one course uh, i feel that gave us in a lot of work and assignments that we did uh, be it a lot of group assignments that we had be it a lot of individual level of assignments that we did lot of them really focused on applying behavioral sciences uh, to societal issues or to to issues that were really important to people so i also have bhaveshi who has done the same course and she would uh, be able to also talk about it uh, so apart from that i think a very good thing about my course was that it really introduced us to different kinds of re- research methodologies uh, so it was not high end on maybe we did not do randomized control t- trials but uh, we were given enough understanding of how to look at data how to interpret a lot of quantitative uh, data regression analysis linear regression multiple regressions of the sorts and really applying those models uh, and statistical methods to different kinds of data sets was something that we engaged with uh, apart from that i think uh, a very really great course uh, that was part of the module is the qualitative research methods and i think uh, it really goes in depth in terms of kinds of research methods you learn a lot more about ethnographic research uh, which is a really great skill set to pick up uh, using ethnographic research alongside behavior design is really a great great uh, way of using research uh, skill set for designing uh, so i think that's really something that uh, was good about the course uh, that i was part of apart from that i think there are just a lot of tons and tons of opportunities on campus in lse uh we have a lot of public speakers and i think that's one of the best things that lse has you have a lot of really famous personalities coming almost every day so on campus there are hundreds of different kinds of thinkers uh speakers talking about different kinds of issues across the globe uh so you get to interact with them you get to listen to them uh which is something that is really like a high high point uh apart from that that while i was a student at lse and i was a student due like uh in 19 2020 so half of my year was online while uh i it moved on uh, sorry half of my year was offline in person and then it switched to uh online so i i saw that transition uh but i think the opportunities that i got on campus was i could i i got in, enrolled into a, a program that lse ra called widening participation where you get to go to public schools in london uh, go interact understand their public systems here guide the students there and you know work alongside with them so it was a good opportunity apart from that there are a lot of student societies that you can engage with a lot of indian students and indian communities of students uh, that you are able to engage it with talk about uh, there are also south east asian uh, society which i i'd love to actually talk about so it's basically bangladesh pakistan india uh, and and i think uh, myanmar these four countries together and students from all these four countries come together and the kinds of panel discussions that uh, are organized are really like uh, something that you learn from so i think we had a uh, india versus pakistan discussion on the kashmir 370 issue and i'm maybe slightly digressing but just trying to give a taste of the student life uh, in lse that i experienced 
uh, lastly, I think while I was there and while I was pursuing my course, um, I joined, I did a summer internship with one of my professors. Uh, my professor, uh, uh, her name is uh, Jennifer Shennington um, and she runs societal psychology lab. And basically uh, she was conducting system systematic review on understanding how po poverty and culture are really related. And so I think largely I was involved in doing a lot of work alongside with her, uh, which was a great learning experience that you can gain from. Uh, and there are a lot of opportunities alongside working with your uh, professors that you can really avail, reach out to them, understand uh, and learn, just learn from. So I think for me, uh, I have been wanting to apply and I want to, I have been wanting to use behavioral sciences for the development sector. Uh, with that understanding, I had really gotten into my uh, course. It's given me a lot of design skills. And I think uh, I've also, I'm really trying to also use a lot of research skills that I've applied to the, uh, to the social and development sector. So one of my, so right now, uh, the place that I work in is a social impact consulting for, firm called Sattva. And uh, one of my research projects, the very recent research project, project is on vaccine hesitancy. So there are a bits and few of, uh, you know, application, a lot of work around ethnographic research and quantitative and qualitative research. Uh, but with some of these projects, I really get to apply a lot of behavioral design aspects. And understand. So, yeah, I feel it's been uh, a lot of love to talk to everyone uh, in the breakout room. So I think I love your glasses. I just want to point that out. <laughs> it has nothing to do with the subject, but yeah. Um, I really like how many uh, behavioral, uh, you know, people in behavioral economics or in behavioral science in general are uh, more geared towards helping out with policy and, you know, the development sector or basically upliftment of people. So I think people who are interested in, um, you know, uh, economic betterment or policy making should also take another look at maybe behavioral science because it really teaches you about context and things like that. So I really loved uh, love that. Uh, so yeah, so um, I think let's move on to the fifth speaker of the day and our final speaker, Radhika Das. Uh, she holds a first class master's degree in behavioral science. She's won an award as a best creative during an entrepreneurial boot camp organized by Stanford. And she's worked with various different startups worldwide for seven plus years to establish herself as a design consultant while strategizing and prototyping seamless user experiences. She's pursuing a PhD in psychology and intending to understand cognitive biases as well as humanizing design. She's currently working with Habit Weekly as a behavioral design consultant responsible for creating interactive case studies based on fresh behavioral science topics. Over to you, Radhika. Thank you for the introduction. I'll go straight with my presentation. Uh, I made a little presentation because I think I'm a visual person. And uh, let me know if you can see. We can. Okay. So I'll go straight with uh, what, what I did you already covered and how I did it and why the reason behind all the journey from being a bachelor's degree in computer science and then um, working as UI UX for seven years. And then after seven years, like uh, master's in behavioral science and now why I'm doing psychology and what, uh, what are the career prospects, what is my thesis and all other minor details I'll cover in the breakout session. So uh, to inspire you all, like uh, I think 70 plus uh, participants are there. So to inspire you all, this degree came like few days ago only. And uh, this is such a nice feeling. And uh, uh, to get this paper, like what was the journey, uh, why I enrolled in Christ, why I chose India, because I was also researching about all the universities that fellow uh, participants were talking about. And uh, this was the, this, this is the original screenshot when I was, you know, choosing the subjects. So 
so the beauty of this uh, master's degree in behavioral science was one of the thing i wanted was interdisciplinary nature and uh, as you if you can see uh, there is very fine print here but i'll just uh, talk it out louder that uh, you can see subjects from behavioral research human resource management subjects from management strategic management economics uh, goals and motivation from psychology economics of banking and insurance so it was kind of a a la carte system where you you can actually choose your uh, uh, you know uh, according to your interest and it was important according to your time as well because i was working side by side i was in bangalore and uh, for four years and i was working with startups and so the core structure was so uh, beautifully designed that in the morning we had classes from 6:30 uh, to 8:30 and then we used to go to work and in the evening we again had the classes so these were like all the subjects like i also studied human machine interface and uh, uh, i was actually kind of relating it because i am coming from the computer science background and then this is kind of a timeline computer science bachelor's degree from miranda house and then um delhi university and then you know working with startups side by side and uh, doing couple of uh, professional degrees so that uh, because i believe and that uh, design is not just a theoretical degree to get in uh, you have to actually practice a lot so i started working with a lot of uh, startups side by side where uh, where i was learning about photoshop uh, at that uh, during that era photoshop was like uh, people were learning photoshop and now is the time for figma and sketch uh, but uh, it was uh, this uh, product design actually took my 7 years and i was kind of leveraging and upskilling my skills here and then uh, behavioral science i actually read this book from daniel really uh, call predictability rational and i started um, researching about which are the colleges that are uh, providing these kind of courses you know because if i have interest you know and i have a kind of a knowledge uh, but people uh, believe, people all like trust in professionals right like we have a bias called authority bias like if you want to go to a doctor you will trust the doctor with the degree so it was my rational at that point of time i don't know like it was my inspiration like uh, let me leverage this knowledge whatever i was studying out of you know just my kind of a side hobby let me convert it into degree you know it will be so it was such a nice course and we had a trimester system and uh, it actually introduced me a lot of uh, subjects from psychology which was so amazing i will say it was a very introductory course i will not say it was a very um you know uh, making uh, things making expert in behavioral science but it was very introductory and uh, during that time i was uh, networking with a lot of uh, people who were you know my classmates or you know i was uh, networking uh, remotely as well uh, with a lot of because i realized this course is very much uh, uh famous like not famous uh very much uh, established in us and uk markets and uh, india is such a like it it's it's a still a niche market here so i actually did a lot of research this so you can see this is a screenshot from behavioral economics guide 2021 and from india only christ university was representing so i i was in bangalore i thought okay let me go to the christ university let me talk to the uh, talk to these people talk to professors how to get in and then they were like they wanted a work uh, work experience so i had that and i gave the interview and uh, get in so uh, so these are the things i was researching but um, i had no study experience in economics or psychology because to uh, to do a uh, master's in psychology you know you have to have a bachelor so i had actually i had this uh, you know uh, psychological barrier uh, that uh, 
I always used to think that I don't have a bachelor's in psychology. Um, my father wanted me to do computer science, so I did that. But uh, I wanted to do in psychology from the start. From seven years, I used to think that no, I can't do. But uh, but if you really really want to, you know, uh, go into some field, you actually get to know that there are certain different paths you can take. So I actually, you know, uh, was lucky enough to uh, jump to this barrier from computer science and psychology. And I'm actually leveraging the, uh, these two fields are so beautiful in themselves. And I'm actually in, working in the intersection. And uh, to keep this uh, presentation very brief, this is the last two slides. I want to give just one uh, friendly you know, advice like I, which I missed was always whatever you are doing, always, always, always uh, show to the people, always keep your, you know, website up and uh, whatever projects you are doing, you just keep, keep it, you know, it's a show business as well. Whatever, like research, because competition is going to get higher only and uh, in design also. So I am like leveraging all this design thing, UI UX thing into behavioral design experience. I uh, was lucky to have this uh, like two weeks of uh, uh, summer school with Karu Consulting with Apurva. She's, uh, she just talked. And uh, now I'm working with uh, Habit Weekly. It's amazing uh, publishing company where uh, they are the pioneers of uh, behavioral design. So, you know, uh, keep keep uh, going on and keep leveraging whatever you have. You just don't have to stop. Uh, one mistake what I did was like I created a mental barrier in my mind that, oh, I can't go into this field or I can't uh, go into that field. You don't have to do that because this is an era of interdisciplinary, right? So uh, right now I'm doing a PhD in psychology and my research thesis is um, in this domain only where, uh, you know, uh, Richard Taylor tried to um, connect uh, this psychology and economics and like I'm trying to connect uh, consumer psychology and behavioral design. So uh, I'm lucky enough to have uh, my guide. She's, she's from DRDO and uh, we are like uh, creating something, learning something, learning new, new tools. Like uh, again, it's a, like all other people were saying it's a again a different kind of a skill set it's a it's a highly skill based uh, study uh, this research it's uh, different from masters uh, research is like you have to uh, learn tools like when i was in design i was learning sketch figma you know html css and all that but in research i am learning S, uh, spss uh, this uh, all those different kind of a uh, uh, languages only so uh like you have to keep leverage and you just have to keep your you have to find your comfort zone and then we'll good to go and thank you uh, i want to thank uh this network it's amazing and uh just keep coming to more sessions thank you thank you so much Radhika. i think uh it's amazing, uh, especially like being in a field and then moving to a different one because of passion. That is just amazing hats off to you. And uh, I think it's an inspiration to others also who would maybe like to step into this space but don't really know how to go about it. So thank you so much. Um,